Okay guys, uh, welcome to the Mary Boozer's channel. This is Papa Boozer with you. He's on his trip to Maine and stopped in by Washington, D.C. And he's went to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in downtown Washington, which is the number one museum in the world to be visited. Now Papa has went out to the Ubar Hazi edition of the Smithsonian Channel. So we're going today to go through this exhibit, uh, one of the one of the most uh, second visited air and space museums in the United States. So I hope you'll enjoy the view. We'll get back to you as soon as we get inside. Okay, so we got into the entrance hall. This is the main entrance to the Air and Space Museum at the airport, at Dulles Airport. So I hope you enjoy the uh, visit and I'll go through as much as I can and, and show you everything I, can, I see, you'll see. Hope you're gonna enjoy the great airplanes of this museum, guys. And it's well uh, designed. As it says, it's a Boeing BFB-5. <laughs> Wonderful uh, museum. If you ever get to visit this, you need to come in person. This is Sunday, so this is a very light day for the museum. Most of the days that real heavy will be uh, Saturday and our holidays. So I tell you not to come on those days. Of course, this museum is well known for really famous airplanes. We'll get to those in a while. But most of these airplanes are historic planes that are something to do with the history of aviation, naturally. This is where you're going to see the vintage airplanes, guys, if you want to come to the museum for those type things. I can't stress enough that if you are an aviation buff, that you need to come to this particular museum. Papa has been, been lucky enough to go to the Museum of the Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. That is another one of the museums that I highly recommend for you to visit if you're if you're in the aviation. Another museum that I really recommend you to go to is the Pensacola Naval Air Museum. Wonderful museum in Pensacola, Florida. Of course, this is this is probably I'm gonna make. World War One, and it's the Newport 28. Of course, it's got the Hat and the Ring squadron that was flown by the the, the Americans in the war. Probably by somebody that was Eddie Rickenbacker, very first ace in World War One. Another great planes, World War I planes down there at the bottom, guys. All of them are very, very highly uh, reconditioned to, to exactly the, they, the way they would be at the time they were flown new. That's a very interesting airplane here. I think, I think this might be the, the one that was about this time of the rides. I don't know. They do do walking tours. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to point it down to a walking tour that's going on at this time. This is a slightly aerodrome from 1903. Built by professors. Finally, you heard Langley Air Force Base, Langley Space Flight Center. The first aircraft carrier in the U.S. Navy was the USS Langley. A few minutes later, you heard the 
So I was explaining to you that this airplane here is called the Langley. And it's a very distinguished professor. Okay, so we're going to continue the tour. We didn't get in one of the walking tours, so I'm going to be the walking tour for you as best I can, guys. I think uh, the museum talks for itself. Uh, a lot of famous airplanes. Beautiful P-51B. And I remember whose airplane this was. Uh, I think this, the Charles F. Blair was a very popular pilot, a renowned pilot. His most claim to fame is that he married in later life uh, a very popular and well-known uh, actress in her day. She was in The Quiet Man. Uh, she was uh, John Wayne's most prevalent actress that was in a lot of his movies. Uh, but, but Charles Blair was married to uh, oh, Maureen O'Hara. The Charles Blair was a very famous pilot that uh, did a lot of records. You can to look him up and find out what Mr. Blair did. Uh, but that's what the significance between the that red airplane was. Now this is a this is a Navy uh, Hellcat. Very famous during World War II, shot down the most zeros. Uh, it must be, it says it's with the be beautiful plane. I think that's an F6F Hellcat, if I remember right. Very famous in the Pacific, for sh and it has the most records for shooting down the most zeros. Now here's a plane that, that I guess is the princess of the whole museum. Everybody already know who this is. It's the Enola Gay. The B-29 that dropped the first nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. And here she is in all her glory. The first time Papa ever seen the Enola Gay was back in the 50th anniversary of World War II. And she was actually in the museum downtown. But the only thing that was there was the fuselage. Nothing else was together. They couldn't get the whole airplane in the museum. So all, the only thing you could see was the fuse. But here she is in all her glory. I understand that they went through every rivet, bolt, and anything that was not, if they had to replace something on that airplane, it is documented that it is not a historic item. But if, if, if the panel on that airplane was there at the time it made history, it is documented. It, it is as, as close to as it could have been the day it flew that mission. Very significant. But there she is, guys. The Enola Gay. I think if I remember right, Papa remembers that she had, there was two bombs that was dropped. One by the Enola Gay, which was Little Boy. Boxcar, the second airplane that dropped the atomic bomb is in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio. If you want to see Boxcar, that's where you would go to see Boxcar. And it dropped the bomb that was known as Batman. So, let's get back to what we are looking at. Beautiful airplanes, guys. You can't ask for anything more if you was an aviation enthusiast to look at this. A lot of planes that lot did a lot of historic stuff. Some that's just was airplanes. A lot of the things you see in the museum pertaining to World War II and enemy aircraft like Germans or Jap Japanese was captured after World War II for evaluation. 
So if, whenever we get to somewhere like that, yeah, everybody recognizes those junctures Ju88. Uh, uh, German uh, was very popular in World War II as far as their transport plane, but that's what that is. I think they called her the a Iron Annie. Was what they called the Allies called the, this plane was Iron Annie. A very significant thing about this Boeing jet here, guys is that this is the first Boeing uh, plane that was the, the real big thing I remember about this Boeing plane is the pilot Tex his name was Tex something the day that he actually did the 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 uh, for the big Boeing crowd he did a roll in this airplane that they think that was very impossible at the time and was not very liked by the Boeing people, but he actually wanted to prove that that airplane could do anything. So it's an airliner, but it, it did do a roll over Seattle, Washington. Monocoupe 110 special little, little bitch. Seriously? Yep. I'll let you read that for a minute and maybe uh, but but it's just a beautiful little airplane would have been wonderful to fly looks like it'd be a great airplane to fly giving you a I think this is the first experimental wing uh, that that eventually led into uh, the wings the aircraft of today uh, but I, I, if I remember right, that's an experimental to see if actually a wing would work. And it was proved uh, by uh, one of the most famous, I think it was Northrop Grumman, that developed the wing. Uh, but the Northrop uh, had a test plane, test beds, and this is one of them, if I remember right. Papa's not a great... He knows a little bit, but he may make an error every once in a while, but I think I'm correct on that one, guys. So we're kind of going to get to the end of the, the uh, mezzanine, and I'm not going to show you how all the little steps to get down there, but as soon as I finish uh, getting down off the mezzanine, and then I will uh, resume the video. Very interesting, guys. This is actually the hangar that they're doing restorations in. And guess what Papa found? I want to know if anybody knows what that airplane is. Does anybody have a clue? It has to do with Howard Hughes. And it was one of the planes that the Japanese copied to make the Zero. That is Howard Hughes' racer that set many of speed records back in the day, in the 30s, fastest plane. And if you notice that that plane, if you ever watch the movie, Howard Hughes said, make her slick, guys. I don't want any, any kind of a rivet on it. And that's the way that airplane looks. I mean, it is smooth as, as silk on the outside. That what made it so fast. He actually run out of gasoline on the first flight. They, they warned him. But he only had so many minutes to fly it. And he loved the airplane so much and how it flew that he forgot how much, and he ran out of gas. And, and he actually plowed up a turnip field or something in California with it. But that plane blow, broke a lot of records. Uh, sorry, I go the wrong way. Or what? But, but this is the restoration hangar. And there's a lot of planes being restored. Really? This that plane looks like one of our RC airplanes. V26 that's being 
looks like being restored. Now, what the significance of that particular B-26 is, I have no idea, but that's what's being restored at this time. There's a, there's a German night fighter that's made of, I think that is a Ju-88, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. As I walked in here, they had the wings and the motors in the other hangar. But this is a restoration, restoration hangar for this museum part of it. So back to you again, guys, when I get to somewhere else you'd be interested in. One of the things I wanted to mention to you guys about the Air and Space Museum and their restorations is all the planes are, are, are put in the back into the original restoration uh, state of, of kind of like new used but these planes will never fly again they go in and take they, they, they go like into the engine they'll go in and take all the rust off of them and and put rust pre preventatives in that engine but that engine will be be to a state that it will never be able to re be run again. Not to say it can't be run again, but it is in, going to be in a preservation state that is not to be ever, probably ever run again. So just so you know, when you come to the this museum, these planes are being preserved for, for a long period of time. Okay, so here we go, guys. We're still on the mezzanine. And here is the Space Shuttle Discovery. Discovery was the last one, if I remember right, to come out of service. And they wanted it to look as, as it come out of service for the last time. So that's why the dirtiness and it looks like it's got the burnts on they want it to look like it just come back from a mission, so that's how it got here. There's a video on how they flew it here for the last time. So if you're really in, into space shuttles, you can look that up, how they brought it from the Kennedy Space Center to here. A very commemorative day when that got here. And uh, Mercury, that's, the, that's one of the Mercury capsules. The first capsules like, like John Glenn flew in was the Mercury, so that's what that is. So we're going to continue our little venture here, guys. But I'm, again, I'm going to shut you off, and we're going to try to come down off the mezzanine. And we'll be down on the floor when Papa resumes this. I'm going to give you a, a, a lot, just to give you an idea how large the restoration hangar is. I'm going to give you a shot of that. And kind of try to peel away and try to give you an idea of how large that restoration hangar is. Okay guys, I'm coming off the mezzanine and guess what I run into? All of these are either satellites or space probes. So, Papa's not into satellites and space probes, but uh, maybe you guys are and kind of interested in what they look like. So here they are in all their glory and what you would see in the Air and Space Museum. So, uh, they've got a missile display over here of what size missiles are and all that. So you guys that are missile gurus, you can see that here also. This is kind of neat, guys. <laughs> this is four, one of 400 mailboxes that was designed to look like R2-D2 uh, in, in the 70s. So, <laughs> uh, Star Wars, here we come, and look at this one. This one looks like Mercury. Of course, a lot of you guys don't have a clue what uh, Mercury was or even that phone looked like, but that's actually a phone that was made during the 60s uh, by the phone company to look like the satellite, uh, the, like the Mercury. But that is actually a pay phone for you young kids that don't know how to use it. Papa's going to show you just to kind of give you a scale of what one of these things look like to people. Pretty impressive as far as what size these things were and how massive this thing is to get up in the air. 
and a peephole to what it looked like. The tiles were usually painted back black and they were very fragile because it was a heat shield. The, the black tiles were actually heat shields. And you can see where the heat flames up over the tiles and that's actually flames that create the difference in the color of the of the white to the discoloration is actually the flames that come off the side because of the heat it actually catches on fire and it's actually it's it's on the wing wings and that was what created the problem where we lost one of them is one of the ice crystals that fell off the the rocket hit the wing <laughs> and damaged the tiles and it was so catastrophic that when they tried to come back into to the Earth's atmosphere it started creating catastrophic damage to the wing and eventually it spread throughout the whole lander and it actually come apart in in the atmosphere all right let's go to okay here's more of the uh, the capsules over the years this is a this one here is a Gemini capsule this one here is an Apollo capsule It doesn't say exactly what Apollo capsule that is. <coughs> Apollo 11. Okay, Apollo 11. So if I remember right, that is that the one that went to the moon? If I remember right? I think that was the one that went to the moon, but uh, could be wrong. Yep, on, on July 24th, 1969, at the end of the historic moon landing, so this is actually Apollo 11 capsule that brought back Neil Armstrong and uh, I think it was Buzz Aldrin and another person and I don't remember, I'm not the biggest uh, space guru, but I, I was alive at the time. Remember it very well sitting in my living room watching Neil Armstrong put his foot on the moon for the first time. Very, it's one of those things that Papa remembers, one of the things I re several things I remember in my lifetime, where I was when JFK was shot on November the 22nd, 1963. I was in the fifth grade. I remember all the mercury. Uh, it was a very special day, when, when, I, when especially when I went to school, we would actually, some a teacher would bring in a TV set and we would actually get to see the historic flights of, of the moon, uh, Mercury, uh, Gemini, and the, of course this one, I was out of school, I was probably a sophomore in high school when the Apollo 11 in 1969, but I remember exactly where I was on all those dates are so important. So here we are, a lot, lot, of, lot, of, lot of space stuff in here guys, if you really like into that, but I want to save the power and look at the airplanes because, because we are an airplane uh, channel, so that's what we're going to show you. So I'm going to turn it off and we're going to go over to the airplanes. All right, guys, look at this one. Look at this. Hey, an ME 163 Comet. The little rocket plane that they, they only had a, a very short time to get up fly through the formations and they'd glide back to earth and how did how did we get this airplane as I explained earlier that after the war or when the war was coming to an end there was a special group of, of uh, intelligence officers that was sent out to seek out all they could know about German technology and they capture these airplanes and sent them back here to be uh, tested uh, and that's why we have these airplanes and they didn't throw them away so they got put in the museum and here it is in all its glory a comet I doubt if there's very few of them in the world today but here it is
or is everybody knows what that one is the 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 the, the rocket plane that we and that's how we got this one was German technology sent it over here and we we uh, looked and seen how it worked and uh, that's how we got this oh the blackbird the blackbird still as, as everybody knows this is still the most fastest plane we know of to this time uh, set many world speed records still holds them today the uh, SR-71 blackbird and the little skunk. Does anybody know what the little skunk means? It was developed at the Skunk Works at Lockheed. Uh, and that's what the little skunk re represents, is the Skunk Works. And a guy named Kelly Johnson that designed the P-38 also designed the SR-71 Blackbird. A lot of interesting stories about the Blackbird. Uh, it would leak like a sieve on the ground because of the material it was made out of and the heat that it would create in flight. So it would leak on the ground and it would not seal up until it come up to a temperature and, and, the, and the skin started to, to shrink. And, and all it would seal itself up but on the ground it would leak like crazy so that was one of the interesting things about the SR-71 so let's go see what else we can find guys beautiful museum I cannot cannot say enough about it. if you get anywhere to Washington DC to Dulles Airport you need to come see it guys this is awesome Everybody understands what, which one this one is. Very significant. We got some models of this one. The MiG that flew in Korea. And of course the Sabre that flew against it. One of my favorite RC airplanes, the Papas, is the F-86. I think today that the F-86 is possibly my favorite RC airplane in, in jets. Okay, uh, this is a, also a really, really good place to do research if you're really wanting to scale out an airplane and look at the rivets that Papa likes to do. Now, this is a place to look at them. See all the rivets? I can't tell you that a plane has a lots of rivet, and Papa don't even go anywhere close to how, how many rivets they have on them. So that's the significance of Papa Dots, is to get that effect on your aircraft. If you've looked at any of our videos on doing how, how we weather and how we, what we call Papa Dots, there she is. There they are. You see them very distinctive in this photograph. So, Papa Dot things, guys. Even, even on the every airplane I don't care if it's this Chinese airplane guess what you see rivets dots get an idea another thing is everybody asks me well where do you put them if you can see they're always on the assembly points but again they're not they're actually, there's a, there, you see what Papa does on both sides, and then he only does some in a single row. Good example of where and how to do dot, uh, rivets, or we call them Papa dots. All right, let's continue here. Let's see if I can't swing out. A little. Uh, Papa has problems with the in and out thing, so forgive me. Everybody know this is Wesley going to ooh-ah on this one, or my son that is on the video chat. With us, he always likes the MiG-21. So there is the exact airplane, MiG-21. I think they called it a fish bed. Or that was the, the designation for it at the time. 
And everybody knows the F4 Phantom. Now, what the significance of this particular F4 Phantom is, I do not know. But maybe it's not the one that uh, some of the most... But anyway, some of the airplanes are not kept just because it, it was just one that they had. And they decided to do something. But F4 Phantom. Oh, look at this beautiful airplane. T-33A. Look at the shine. Look at the, I mean, this thing you could eat off of. I wish they'd make a model of this airplane. I know a lot of you have asked for it, and nobody's done it. But straight wing, not the first jet, but real close to the first jet was this particular jet. And I wish they would model this particular airplane. But, as of this time, no, they have not. A6 Intruder. Have you ever seen the flight of the Intruder? Here it is. It's a larger airplane than most people think. You know, that's the funny part about it, is these things are a lot larger than most people think. But there she is. And I, if you've ever seen videos, if you stood, st uh, some people, if you stood too close to that intake, you'd get sucked up in it. That thing has that much suction that if you was in three feet of that thing, and you was a probably a 150 mile man you could get sucked up into that thing they've got, actually got videos showing that if you've ever seen them but the but the intruder is quite large aircraft okay here's a new one the f-35b everybody just got their models on this one i mean uh, uh the uh i mean everybody's just getting them now it's june uh, 19 uh, uh, 2019 and they just released a new model of this particular airplane I'm going to get back a little farther so you can have a little bit better view of it but there she is but it's here and this must be one of the test bed aircraft of and why it's been restored or kept here it's the only reason I would think but I, I can't read everything to you guys I wish I could but I can't, but I can't, I know that it's the, uh, well, it's the X-35, so it is the, the test airplane that they tested before they went into production, okay? That's what the submission it is. Okay, here's one that we really like. Is the Vought. This is a reconnaissance airplane. Because it's an RF, R meaning reconnaissance, F mean fighter. So it's an RF 8G Crusader. Something tells me that this would be one of the airplanes that flew, flew over Cuba when John Kennedy decided that there was going to be some nuclear weapons on Cuba. And this is probably one of the airplanes that flew over Cuba and took the photographs that proved that there was actually nuclear weapons in Cuba. It was a very fast airplane, especially real low on the ground. So that's what the that is. Woo! Everybody knows Top Gun. Here it is. Here's the Top Gun guru. And everybody, I really probably don't have to tell everybody what this one is, but anyway i will as soon as i give you a little bit better view of it the grauman f-14 tomcat uh, and it should say uh, uh, but but everybody knows top gun so there she is f-100 super saver the first airplane to go supersonic and level flight very fast airplane f-100 Super Saber, made by North America. Okay, so here we go again. This airplane was not very well liked in the Navy. It actually superseded the uh, the uh, 
it was a heavier bomber, but it was not easy to fly, and uh, it was not very liked. It was not in service very long, but it's the Helldiver, SB2C Helldiver. It just, it was not very well accepted uh, and went out of service very quickly right after World War II. But it did its job. The next airplane to me is a, going to be a Sikorsky, I'm gonna guess, some kind of uh, float plane. Uh, what the significance of this particular float plane is, and it is in rough condition as you can tell uh, I don't know it's, it's in navy blue don't can't tell you exactly what the significance of this airplane is other than it's, it's just, I'm, I'm almost positive Sikorsky's look pretty familiar so we'll see significant airplane okay I read the sign guys what is significant about this particular float plane, it is the only, the only plane in this museum that actually was in Hawaii at Pearl Harbor at the time of the attack on December 7, 1941. The only airplane in the museum that was actually at Pearl Harbor was this Sikorsky and it, it was sent out to try to find the fleet that uh, or the Japanese fleet that day so that's the significance of this particular airplane and it does have it was this is not battle damage this is just time sitting outside but uh, anyway that's the significance of that particular airplane there's a tremendous amount of of motors uh, in this to give you an idea of what motors flew what we won't get into that we're going to keep going on in the museum on the aircraft if I have time and batteries, we'll come back to the motors. Marine, uh, I bet you this has something to do with the last day of the war, I'm going to guess. But it is a CH-46 Sea King. And I'm trying to read a little bit, South Vietnam, Marines, da 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 da. So this is a la it's painted in the last year of service in Vietnam, da da da. Uh, do the mission include. So anyway, that's what the significance of that is. Everybody knows what a Huey is. A UH-1H. And, and then we got the Huey that become a gunship. And that is the Bell AH-1F Cobra. I'm not a big helicopter guy, but anyway, they got helicopters here too. Yeah. A missile, guided missile, SA-2. Everybody knows what an SA-2 Sam is. Well, you always heard about them shooting them up. It looked like a telephone pole. Well, that's what an SA-2. Sam missile looked like that was shot at all the guys. So I'm running out of battery, guys. Of course, everybody knows what this is. It's it's awfully a huge. Look at the huge size of the thud. The Republic F-105. So I'm gonna have to shut it down, guys, here for a minute and try to charge the battery somewhere. So we're gonna shut her down. But look how large it is. I mean. It, Guys, this airplane is huge. Uh, of course, it was built to, to fly nuclear weapons, not to do what it did in Vietnam. And there was quite a few of them shot down because they had them so heavily loaded uh, that it made them a target. So anyway, I'm gonna shut it down. We're gonna try to find somewhere to charge the battery. And then we're gonna start again. Okay, we will continue our tour now that we've recharged our batteries. Um, I'm not going to try to tell you a whole lot about all the airplanes because uh, I will run out of batteries. Right in front of us, right there in front of us is a P-26P-1 
pea shooter, I think they call it a pea shooter, was uh, developed in the 30s before the war. Uh, a bird dog in front of us, Vietnam era uh, reconnaissance plane. Another uh, uh, experimental wing might be the one that uh, they developed to experiment Northrop N1, which which was actually the Northrop uh, test bed to see if a wing was feasible. P61 Black Widow night fighter, World War II, yeah. a Japanese bomber. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm trying to remember what it is, but we will see. It's called a Nakajima Irving. J1N1. So another thing that was captured after the war, probably tested. The Oka, the flying bomb, man flying bomb, which was the technology that the Japanese got from the. Uh, the but this thing would have been a release from that particular airplane, that bomber there. Probably had the Oka underneath it actually was a suicide plane. You can see where the pilot sit. And it was a flying bomb that was a man, man, man bomb. Uh, okay, so here we go. It's a Dornier DO-335. Most popular thing. It's got two, one engine in the front and one engine in the back. Beautiful example. Another thing that was captured after World War II. The, the first jet bomber. Uh, uh, was here is this particular airplane uh, very very uh, technology was very advanced during World War II uh, I think it would have been very hard to fly this airplane probably been like sitting in a, in a heat box with all that glass but anyway it, there it is right there it's called the Blitz And a lot of you guys really like the FW-190 Butcher Bird. Well, there she is in all her glory. The Butcher Bird, FW-190. Over across from us, the Nakajima George. Is this particular airplane we're looking at here? I think it was kind of held back into the, the war from the Japanese islands, but it was a very competitive airplane compared to our, our stuff at the end of the year. Again, the Nola Gay is up above it. The Kingfisher up above that. Here we go, guys. Everybody knows how well a P-47 Thunderbolt flies, but here she is in all her glory here. The P-47 Thunderbolt. You, as, and as the Boozers has told you, probably one of the best flying warbirds as far as an RC warbird is this particular plane. It's called the Jug. Uh, it's heavy, it's big, but it's got great flight characteristics. Beautiful example of a P-47 Thunderbolt or what was no, known as the Judge. Okay, so we we that's the FW190 again. We're going to go down to the center. Uh, again, that Boeing plane uh, that was was it was still being flown by the Air Force as a tanker many years that that plane was a has been many things over the years the dash 80 I forgot it was called the dash 80 and let's see first flown in 1954 it was a very 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 uh, great airplane and like I said until uh, now They've been tankers for the Air Force. The KC-135, if I remember right, was what the tanker was called. 
and just now being replaced. Iron Annie again, or that's what uh, people call the, the, this airplane uh, the, that was flew in the war for the Germans as far as their transport aircraft. And it's called the Junkers Ju-52. All right. Oh, we're going to get to see the Belanca. Uh, if anybody remembers an old movie, Calling Belanca, Calling Belanca. I don't. You have to go back a while for that one, guys. But that is actually a Belanca. A Jenny. Anybody remember a Jenny from World War One? Was it was the trainer aircraft of World War One? The Jenny. There she is. Great airplane for that time. A lot of the barnstormers after World War One, the ex pilots could buy a Jenny for like two hundred bucks, less than that. And this is what most of the barnstormers would have flew around in the late, early 20s for, uh, they, they'd land and, and give people rides. And that was the plane that did it, was the Jenny. Was a lot of them surplus to ever World War I. The 307 Strat, Boeing's 307 Strata floor, the, probably the first, uh, 1938 and was the first one that had a pressurized fuselage so that's the significance of that airplane oh i bet you this is bob hoover's the great bob hoover and his uh, um, airplane that he would it was amazing what Bob Hoover could do in that airplane. Um, but uh, that, that was actually Bob Hoover's airplane. The Concorde, I'm standing under the Concorde. That is actually the Concorde's wing air intake. I forgot to show you that, but we're, we're actually sitting under the Concorde as we speak. That's a test bed for Sikorsky Air. And so it actually burned a ton of fuel for every passenger that flies across the That's called the little GB. Pretty little airplane. Coupled with the laws that prevented overland supersonic travel. Okay, guys, I've only got five minutes. There's the Connie Constellation. So we're going to have to. I'm going to shut it off and see if I can't find something else for you guys to look at and save a little power. Anybody want to see the world's smallest? There she is. Sky Baby. And that's this, you, uh, radio controlled. <laughs> no, it's not. You actually set it in fluid. Radio controlled. The smallest jet. Was that one there? It's called a BD-5B, 200 miles an hour. No, I guess it isn't a jet. It's a prop plane. Made a jet. Some two airplanes is kind of interesting here. There, this this plane is called. This was developed by a man named Bert Rutan, and it was called the the very easy. It's got a canard wing up front. It's a really popular airplane for experimentals and self-built airplanes this is another airplane developed uh, designed by Burt Rutan it's called the quickie uh, just you know it's really uh, kind of uh, doesn't really look like an airplane but uh, it flow and it does real well as far as I know This is an airplane designed by a Frenchman to be the first home-built and you can actually teach yourself to fly this, it says. 
so I don't know about that, but uh, but the first. Okay, guys, uh, this is the uh, airplane that Roscoe Turner, a very very flamboyant flyer in the 30s that won like the Bendix races, the air races of the 30s. He was a very 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 predominant flyer in those days named Roscoe Turner. If you don't know who all of those are, of course another great flyer at that time was Jimmy Doolittle and this airplane is the RT-14 and won the Bendix in the uh, races in like 38 and 39. Roscoe Turner was a very colorful man. Here, I'm going to show him your, his flight uniform. He always dressed like an aviator or Army Air Corps aviator, but he, he was really uh, wanted to look like the, the aviator that he was. It's one of the trophies that he won. So Roscoe Turner, look him up and uh, find out about what goes on there. This is uh, the uh, Bearcat, one of the Bearcat that won the air races in the in the 70s and actually had a speed record, fastest prop driven airplane for a while. Uh, sorry guys, I missed a whole line of airplanes. I don't think you want to miss this. P-38 Lightning. Uh, Fork Tail Devil. Of course, I told you it was designed by Kelly Johnson, the same designer that j designed the SR-71. And here's a Hawker Hurricane. I didn't say I see a spit Spitfire in here. That don't mean there isn't one, but here's the Hurricane. Always would like to have a bigger version of this airplane, like a 1600 millimeter uh, about the size of the Spitfire would love, love to have one of those of course the trainer the basic trainer of World War II the Stearman and here's another revolutionary uh, aircraft uh, the first helicopter the Sikorsky whatever it was but that's the very first helicopter the soft width camel anybody I've got one of these models at home, but this is a real thing. Isn't it gorgeous, guys? Look at that. I wish uh, I could uh, to give a great, as much as having a great view of these things. Uh, I hope this gives you some idea. The Blario. Blario, I think, was the first guy that flew across the English Channel. So that was, and that's the type of aircraft he flew in. Wesley, I'm taking this picture for you to, so you can see the weathering on this airplane for future painting. I'm gonna zoom in on it and let you look. One more time, I couldn't resist the upper level showing you the, what it looks from the upper level. So, uh, just can't resist guys, showing you what it looks like from the upper deck level of the Ubar Hazy Smithsonian Museum. So there it is. Wesley, this is another short shot for you as far as the, the, uh, the aging on the plane and what it looks like. I can only do it for a few seconds because I'm about to run out of power. All right. I'm hoping you can see this. I'm trying. 